Well, good morning, and uh, let me first start thanking the organizers for this kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and participating with you in this uh, very interesting event. I'll try to discuss with you some uh, of the challenges and opportunities in health research to emphasize that we need new health interventions and also discuss some potential approaches in tropical disease research and development. Um, we think that health is a key element of economic development. I think the Macroeconomics and the Health Commission has clearly put this uh, in writing. We think also that uh, health research is an essential link to equity in development. And we know that resources are very limi limited. And uh, in fact, people now call it the 10 night gap, which is that uh, less than 10% of the global spending on health research is devoted to the disease or condition that affect 9% um, of the global disease burden. I divide my talk into three parts, a little bit on neglect diseases, uh, and particularly malaria. Then I will go a little bit on the underfunded research and, and why we have poor health interventions and if we can change this reality. I bought this, um, this graph from um, MSF. They published a nice study called Fat Imbalance, but also uh, an article by the journalist Yame, which was published in the British Medical Journal, where they say that um, the diseases, you could classify them into global diseases, neglected, and the most neglected diseases. And this is square there is where the world market uh, addresses the attention. Uh, most of it in global diseases, I'll come to that later. A little bit in neglected disease like malaria, and almost not paying attention to diseases like aftertoponosomiasis. Uh, you may know that we now have some hope in aftertoponosomiasis because a florentine was shown to be good for uh, against hair uh, treatment. So the rich women, uh, they can buy it, and with this, the company can then give a little bit to treat African trypanosomiasis. Um, let me show a little bit about uh, malaria. This was a film we made for uh, showing before the Johannesburg uh, World Summit uh, with some funds from the, global, uh, the World Bank because we, we think there is a, a need of much more awareness and advocacy in these neglect diseases. Coming to malaria, this is a distribution of uh, malaria uh, in three years, 46, 66, 94, and you see that it's confined in most of the tropical regions. And this is the global distribution of the per capita GDP. Uh, and if you compare both, you see that it's almost a superposition of poverty and malaria. And this interplay between poverty and disease is being the object of this, of this meeting. This is a graph on the evolution of under five mortality uh, in several different regions. It, it's going down, but as you see, in the African region, particularly sub-Saharan Africa, it has more or less stabilized. And it does not go down as the other, in the other areas it goes down. That's the blue curve over there. Uh, and this is more or less distribution of uh, malaria. And uh, in red, you have the endemic malaria. When I travel, I, 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 I like to take some pictures. And this is, on, this is a, 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 let's say, a health uh, service in the, around something like 70 kilometers from, uh, uh, from Kampala, in Uganda. And this is uh, uh, where people bring their children and the patients, <coughs> our patients, to be treated. Uh, and you have a long line of, of patients, and they try. And this was also a picture that I took, that they used this to uh, explain what is malaria. And uh, you see the malaria is the most common disease in Africa, especially sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it most affects children. So this is some sort of uh, trying also to inform the patients. And this is a picture of the laboratory that makes the diagnosis of malaria. Uh, I don't think you can compare with the MBL laboratories. You see a hand centrifuge there. Not the kind, Richard, that we were fighting 30 years ago in Israel. 
Uh, okay, this is a kind of uh, reality. And why do I have this picture of the hippopotamus there? Because in Africa, you cannot say the tip of the iceberg. There is no iceberg in Africa. So people refer to the ears of the hippopotamus. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and in fact, when you see the mortality in Africa, uh, in the hospital, you are seeing only 5% of mortality. In the clinics that I showed you, you see only another 15%, but 80% of mortality of, of uh, malaria in Africa is at home. You don't see. So the picture you see is really the ears of the hippopotamus. So what about some health uh, uh, interventions in, against malaria? Malaria control has a long story, very long story. I'm going to refer a little bit on some historical developments. From 55 to 69, there was uh, the Global Malaria Eradication Campaign. The world thought could wipe out malaria with DDT. I think Janet's going to speak a bit more about that. Then they realized it was impossible. They adopted a Global Malaria Control Strategy. Recently, there was a multilateral malaria, and in 98, the Rollback Malaria Movement started. If you want to read a little bit on, on control of malaria, I devised this, this paper, Jose Nahara, eight, nine pages on malaria control, achievements, <coughs> problems, and strategies. Really very nice and well written, published in this Italian journal, Parasitologia. Some historical developments. First thing you did about malaria was trying not to get it, preventing it. So site selection would not leave where people say that malaria is there. You would uh, do sanitation, regulation of agriculture. You would prevent mosquito bites, it's something that was there for a long time. And very important in some places, stabling, so that the mosquitoes would go to the animals, not to the people. And since uh, historical times also, the Chinese knew that uh, Artemisia annua as a plant was good. And the South American Peruvian Indians, they knew that Cinchona, which is the origin of quinine, was also good. Uh, this is a 18th century map showing where the priests decided not to to sleep in the same place, because it was too dangerous to sleep there. So this was a prevention of malaria. They would go there, do the church work, but they would go to another place to sleep. It would be too dangerous. So this is prevention of malaria. This is malaria in the United States. And there are three sort of peaks. Uh, this is uh, the economic crisis of 29. Uh, let's say as you, as you slow the economic level, you have a, a rise in malaria, even in the United States. Then you have a peak in the Second World War, people coming back. Another one uh, in the Korea War, people coming back. But despite that, the tools were enough uh, to drop malaria to uh, zero mortality. This is a picture when the malaria eradication program was at its highest. It was a military operation program. You, 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 we have the tools, we can do it, don't need any more, any more research and just apply it. Okay, it worked, but uh, then it did not work in several places. It worked in the periphery, in the rich countries, did not work in Africa. So this was more or less the, uh, the after the malaria education campaign, the control sustainable strategy. These were the tools that were used until today. Let me go a little bit now on science and why the issue in Africa is so different from the rest of the world. Let us go a little bit on the habitat of Anopheles Gambia. And uh, let me show you one very interesting experiment that the group of uh, Professor Mario Luzzi did and which shows the interesting behavior, uh, not for humans, but the interesting behavior that Anopheles Gambia has. This is a kind of trap. Uh, this here is a fun. You can have an experiment like that. You, have a, uh, you can put a human in one tent, a monkey or another animal in the other tent, and the fans blow some air and then you have here the entry traps. The mosquito goes to where it feels attracted, enters either if it's attracted by the human bait or by the uh, monkey or, or the animal. And look at the uh, uh, results for Anopheles gambia. Doesn't matter what you put there, Anopheles gambia goes to man. And people say, the experts tell me that if you have a football, soccer a field with a lot of animals and one man in there, the Anopheles would go and choose that person. So, stabling would not help Africa, as it did not. The, the behavior of the insect is very different. These are some data on uh, protecting people with bed nets. 
uh, insecticide impregnated bed nets. You do protect, but it depends very much which is the pressure that the mosquito exerts in people. And we measure this pressure on uh, entomological inoculation rates. Let's see how many effective bites you get per year. In the Amazon region, for instance, uh, uh, where most of it is in Brazil, perhaps one to five. In some places in Africa, above 500. So it's very different. And this, uh, the effect of that is shown in this slide. As you have a higher transmission pressure, bed nets are less and less efficient, of course. If you protect uh, 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 in a high transmission rate 90%, the 10% that still remains is 10 times higher than the pressure in the Amazon region. So, uh, what is the bottom line? The bottom line is that we need new tools. We cannot go on with existing tools in some settings. And this was a slide I took from uh, uh, Joe Bremen, um, where he puts the existing tools in new directions. Let me go a little bit on global challenges. I think there is a, a very dramatic and bad synergy between two issues. One are the so-called market forces. Okay, these are neglected. It's very risky to invest in this disease. But there is uh, something which reinforces that. It's the attitude that Paul Farm was telling this morning. People say, we don't need research. We have the tools. So the pharmaceutical companies don't, don't want to spend the money. And they hear people say, we don't need new drugs. Why bother them? And why, for instance, the program I direct, uh, Trove Disease Research, it was created in 75. It was only in 1999, after several fights, and I think Barry Bloom perhaps is going to be with us tonight, that we put tuberculosis as one of our diseases. Why? People said in 75, we have all the tools. We don't need to do any research on tuberculosis. So I think these two things really uh, reinforce each other. And we have to try to, to break this uh, synergy, saying that we don't need new tools. We do need new tools. Uh, this is the portfolio done by the American pharmaceuticals themselves. Uh, and this bottom line is that uh, they are really not interested. And they could not. They, are, they have to respond to their shareholders. There is only one uh, drug being developed against parasitic diseases, no vaccines being developed against drug disease in the big companies. And this is the graph of, let's say, their priorities. And of course, the priorities reflect the needs of the advanced countries. So can we change this reality and how? I think we can. Sometimes with very simple interventions. Paul has already uh, shown us today. And uh, although we need macro change, but let us go to some things that we can be done. First, correct priority setting. In TDR now we do, let's say, we have to, to, to hear the control needs but we also have to hear the science opportunities. We cannot be working as if science has not advanced. Um, I am not going to work on this today, but uh, we have, uh, uh, I'm going to show some reference on that. We have to fight the, the global drug gap, and I'm going to sh speak a little bit about a drug we developed against uh, visceral leishmaniasis. Um, I'm going to briefly to show you something about the prevention of malaria by giving anti-malarial uh, uh, drugs during immunization campaigns. And a very interesting experiment that uh, uh, it's really a policy experiment how to invest better the money in a given country. Uh, as I told you, I don't have time to today. Uh, uh, we have a, a different way of priority setting. We published this paper now in October in Transient Parasitology. And the editors liked it so much, asking me the permission to publish it also in Transient Microbiology. So, well, I'm not going to how I'm going to cite a paper published in two, two journals, but okay, go on. <laughs> Um, basically, uh, what we did was, let's say, we have three categories of disease, those are, are uncontrolled, those which are more or less controlled, and those which are decreasing. And we can work on basic knowledge, improve the tools, so we can go, uh, we have now a, a clear set of, uh, of uh, uh, priorities for every disease and every, let's say, if it's basic science or if it's more field work. But I don't have time to go over it today. Michael Raj described the global drug gap in a, a nice paper in 2000, and he acknowledged that something can be done, and he was kind enough to refer to our program. And Medicine Sans Frontier, who is doing a marvelous job uh, uh, in this area, 
has shown that drug development uh, is, a, is, is a result not only of a deficient market, but also of a public health policy failure. Uh, and they show that uh, uh, these are the drugs which are, are, are being developed these days for the disease of the poor. And unfortunately, they, most of them are being developed by us. And our budget is 1,000, the budget of NIH. We have $30 million per year, despite all our efforts. We only got, uh, uh, let's say, some movements. We are budget increasing. I'm going to speak about that later. But it's very hard to find money for neglect diseases. Despite that, one can do something. One can do a lot of things. This year, uh, methylfosine, which was a drug that was in shelves, it was a drug developed for cancer. But as in cancer, you need continuous application, it became too toxic. And uh, one of our scientists discovered it could be used for leishmania. And together with uh, the German company, uh, Zentaris, uh, and the Indian investigators, we took this drug from phase two, phase three, and phase four starting, and registration. And our investment was around $2 million. The German company invested uh, $30 million. So you can leverage. You can leverage with a small amount of money. And this drug now, it cures 98% of the patients by oral administration. And other countries start to register it also. Something also very interesting. <coughs> this was an idea of some investigators. We support the first phase is, let's say, in the areas where malaria is highly endemic, if you take the kids to vaccination at three, six, and nine months, and you give uh, a drug to prevent malaria, so you do preventive uh, malaria treatment, and you give some iron to, to fight anemia, the results are incredible in terms of efficacy. Between 50 60% reduction in uh, uh, first clinical episode, uh, series of anemia, hospitalization, morbidity. We are now, uh, uh, Gates and Bellina Foundation, they are now going to support a much broader, large-scale implementation of this policy, which in fact, you just add the UNICEF and the EPI, Expanded Program Immunization, is scheduled with giving some new drugs. An experiment which I think is also marvelous, and it was published in The Economist. I tried to get uh, any other reference, but I could not get but it was published in The Economist. And it's, uh, it's, uh, 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 it's uh, a matter of putting money where it is really needed. What, what this, this uh, uh, IDRC THIP collaboration did? You have the graph in dark blue is the burden of disease. On the left side, uh, the other bars are where the budget for health was being uh, uh, invested. And as you see, there was not really a correlation. They were vaccinating several times, but under treating malaria. So what they did was just redirection your budget. Put your budget where it's really needed. You see? So this is real public health policy. And the results, and, and there in the other area was after the budget reshaping. And uh, I was during f uh, five years part of the Cabinet Minister of Health of Brazil, and we, were, we had something there, Paul. We called decibel priority setting. Those that would shout higher, close to the minister, would get the funds, you see? So this is not decibel priority setting, this is perhaps planning priority setting. And, uh, uh, and these were the results in one district. Infant mortality uh, dropping by 28%, and proportion of uh, children dying before fifth, fifth birthday, 14% reduction. So just with a redirection of the budget. So we think it can be done something, but I think we need something much bigger. And we are all aware of uh, what was happening uh, some uh, weeks ago when the two genomes were sequenced. Uh, this year there was also a big breakthrough in shaping the first mosquito, that first anopheles, that cannot transmit malaria. So there are some new hopes in the horizon. Uh, I, I like very much this, uh, this fiction. Uh, Singh and Dar, they published a paper, and they were uh, imagining a report of the World Bank 2010. If the genomics would not have been brought to the poor countries. And uh, they say there would be a genomic divide. Uh, unfortunately, genomics did not uh, uh, serve. And, uh, so, and then they discussed how we could avoid that. 
In fact, uh, they also made a, a very nice report which has been published, I think it's free uh, online. Uh, it was published in Nature Genetics. They asked a panel, and this was the panel uh, that they used, which were the 10 biotechnologies that should be mostly driven towards developing country needs. And these are the results. Uh, molecular technology for diagnosis, recombinant technology for vaccines against viral diseases, and you have a, a, a list of, uh, of uh, the 10 areas where this group of experts think there should be more outcome. Uh, but <laughs> there is a lot of debate, and a lot of scientists, don't, even scientists, don't believe that this is going to happen. Um, when this uh, science uh, published the, the signal genome, one of the points, one of the viewpoints was published by ourselves from, from TDR. Uh, we had the clear view that this is a breakthrough for public health. But look some of the comments we got. I'm skeptical that the anonymous mosquito genome will actually be useful in attempts to control malaria in very poor countries. I have a feeling that projects on the genome are done because molecular biologists think they are going to be done and are exciting to do. The justification are then added on afterwards. One suggested that one could make telomere insecticides. However, I doubt if this would be afforded by governments with health budgets of $5 per head per year for all diseases. So there is a, a distrust, even scientists, this is not anonymous, this is a very famous scientist, who think that genomics is of no use because people will not uh, uh, be, be able to, to buy things. Fortunately, there are people that have a, a better vision, you see, and they think that, no, it's not like that. Uh, there will be opportunities, and uh, of course, I'm, I think I'm in this group. Uh, and let me take an example from uh, which was published in Germany. I think we all know this paper. Uh, this group uh, by uh, Joma and, and Gissen, they just, sc by screening the plasmodium database before publishing, before publishing, this was 99 paper, and the Nature paper was published now. So they found enzymes that were in, this, uh, in, in the plasmodium that no one expected them to be because they were enzymes of, of algae or plants. And they showed that uh, these enzymes, if they were there, they could be inhibited by a very well-known antibiotic, phosmidomycin. They said, well, come on, we never thought using phosmidomycin against malaria because we thought it would not be useful. But the genome database that we screened showed that this target is there. So, uh, when they put the paper, we called them, and we quickly called the Japanese company that produced for midomycin, and we ran some tests in, 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 uh, in Gabon and Thailand. And it really showed that uh, uh, it can be used for human use. It was antibiotic, mostly for urinary infections. It has to be given, perhaps, with another drug, because as you see, particularly in Thailand, you, can, you see resistance coming very quickly. But as we have not so many drugs, you, this is a new drug which can be developed further. So even before genome was published, we had a new thing. And uh, also, before the anophyl genome was published, a lot of people were screening the database. Uh, uh, Fortis made some marvelous work on, on comparing Drosophila and, uh, and Anopheles and looking at the refractory genes. And people are, are, are going and, and looking at the other genes, how, how they can cope, for instance, that, uh, that uh, uh, behavior of Anopheles that goes only to man, you see? I think uh, Janet is going, I borrowed it from your paper in science, Janet, <laughs> but she, she shows that how many new avenues you can open with this, uh, with this uh, genomics. It's a whole new universe. And I think we have to be very paying attention to that. And I, I'm going to finish by quoting a paper by Brother Hoffman and Hotes, which was published in the Ambo Reports. And they show a very clear correlation where um, Conflict is, and the prevalence of disease. Here, for instance, is uh, countries, uh, let's say you have a, a child mortality under five, let's say the more you have child mortality, the more conflicts you have. Let's say there is always this, source, this sort of correlation. Of course, people are despair, it's much more prone to conflict. And this is also true for tuberculosis. The more you have tuberculosis, the more you have conflict. The more you have HIV, the more you have conflicts. In fact, they have this map that shows that there is a, this coincidence. And uh, because some time ago, people would say that you need development to get better health. Now we are seeing the contrary also. It's also true. 
We need health to get development coming. So this is a, is a siege, not only one direction. And I think th this is very important for us, for us to hear. And this issue of global security, you cannot have global security if you only invest in rich countries. You have to invest all over. And I'm finishing this last slide with this phrase by Singer which I think is very interesting. That the lessons learned can be applied to build success genomics and biotechnologies in developing countries and to change the concept of genomics for developing countries to one of genomics by developing countries. I think that's a, a, a big change in things. We, we, we cannot think that uh, uh, we are responsible for bringing the good tools to the poor people. No, I think we have a lot of very good brains in the good people, and I think that's one of the things we should invest on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos, for this uh, very stimulating uh, review of where research is needed and what it can contribute. Comments, please. Now we go from this side, for reasons of equity. <laughs> please. Please identify yourself. Uh, Dr. Avila von Nadenburg. Uh, I was a bit surprised, if not to say a bit frightened, to see a picture of a written statement for information on malaria in an African country. And I'd be interested in uh, learning if this is the only method they have of uh, providing information about malaria in countries where the literacy rate is extremely low. In Burkina Faso, for instance, one of the most important means of uh, providing information on health is the radio because just about everyone has a transistor radio. Other possibilities are films in areas where you have electricity, and if you don't, then you can use dramatic plays. Uh, but one thing that hospitals could do would be instead of a written information, just a storyboard with pictures that could be explained by the personnel. Sorry, I think my, my fault, I did not explain it it's correctly. I think that was used by the hospital administration to raise awareness among the nurses and the person and the staff, you see, to teach. It was not, uh, let's say, for, for, for mass uh, media. I, I fully agree with you. And I think this is changing a lot. Uh, from my own perspective, I come from Brazil, Latin America. It was so much easy to do public health after you get TV and uh, uh, even today use a lot of radio. For instance, uh, uh, in my institution, we used to do some programs and, and even have a TV channel. You go to millions of people. And one of the tools we used was, uh, as you know, perhaps Brazil, so popular, are very popular. We wrote um, a manual for so popular authors. So they could put in the history uh, something. For instance, someone goes to a car, make it put the belt so that uh, people see that this is going on. Uh, there was a debate, put be be behind it a poster about AIDS, HIV AIDS. So we distributed this manual in Brazil uh, to something like 10 uh, authors, also populars. And uh, it was fantastic how, how they took it in some of these, uh, and this is subliminal teaching perhaps. <laughs> see, people are using this so populars, but they see that. But I fully agree, I did not explain that was for teaching the, the hospital staff. Thank you very much. Anybody else from the right hand side? Malabika, please. Uh, my question is about PageNet because many of the African countries, even they cannot, more, like I said, 70 or 80 percent people do not have any bed net. So even then, you are talking about the transmission pressure. So do you think that bed net is not useful, which is no, feasible no. and cheap and <laughs> affordable? No, no, look, uh, uh, there is all this, this, this uh, question because uh, uh, the fact I don't. What I say is that uh, we have to use the tools that we have now, you see, that's no question. And all, most of these tools, we have been involved in developing. Bad nets, we helped a lot developing them. What we have to think that we should not stop doing research for better tools because we have bad nets, you see? Uh, and I think once uh, uh, we wrote something, and, and, and Dr. Brundtland also spoke on that, let's say, we have to do everything we can with the tools we have, we have at this stage. But we have also to try to develop better tools. For in bed nets, we are developing the permanent uh, impregnation of insecticide bed nets so that we don't, do not have to reimpregnate every year, you see? So we have long-lasting bed nets, you see? The problem is that you have, it's a very complex issue. 
In one particular place, for instance, uh, we are called because people were not using bed nets, they refused to use bed nets. So we, we went to, to see what was going on. In that local culture, they used nets to, to, when someone would die, they would put the nets around the body. And then people would say, I'm not going to sleep in a net because this, uh, I can be dying, you see? So there is these behavioral issues, there are economic issues. There was a big fight for us to convince governments to remove the taxes on importation of bed nets. Now there are several companies which are making beautiful bed nets because in the beginning they were very ugly, you see? Now you have colorful ones, so now it became also a matter of decoration of the house. And it's, it's, it's getting there. But uh, I don't believe that it's, it's, it's going to sort out in the public health area. Uh, you need a lot of coverage, a lot of coverage, particularly where you have a, a very high pressure. But they are useful and we are stimulating. Thank you, Carlos. Now I turn to the left side and ask for somebody else. Oh, sorry. I mean, I agree with Dr. Morel, Morel mm -hmm. that there is certainly need to continue our research and looking for new tools. Because uh, last week I read a story that in Uganda they are using bed nets to make bride, bride gowns, wedding gowns. So I mean, if, if that's what uh, bed nets are going to be used for, then definitely we need an alternative. Yeah. <laughs> But my, my, my question is, um, looking at the list of the neglected diseases that you're talking about, a lot of them are transboundary diseases. And in Africa today, in different countries, you have different degrees of these diseases. You have, in, the, in a scenario whereby you have an Ebola outbreak in Uganda, you have trypanosomosis outbreak in Angola, HIV AIDS in South Africa, malaria in Kenya, and, and so on, different epidemics and outbreaks in different countries. How do you get the, the African governments to prioritize the diseases? And I think that <coughs> there is no consensus about that in Africa today. What diseases do you tackle initially? So then who sets the agenda? Who, who's, who determines what the priorities are? Well, priority setting in the health, uh, in public health, is a, is a very, very complex issue. And not only priority setting, but how to move quickly the new tools until control. Um, the experiment I showed um, on the TEHIP IDRC, perhaps one of the very first that shows a shift in priority by measuring the burden and trying to match the investment with the burden. I cannot speak too much about Africa, but I can speak a lot of uh, my own country in Brazil. And uh, for instance, uh, priority setting sometimes is done by Congress. In Congress, you have uh, rich deputies which have their own hospital. So most of the money goes to tertiary healthcare. It's very difficult to fight for money for vaccination sometimes, you see. Uh, we, wh what we try to do is also, there, there is also this big discussion on vertical versus horizontal programs. When someone comes, okay, malaria is a priority, but then people say, no, no, but we cannot have a vertical, only a malaria program. You have to have strengthened health systems. You cannot go on a disease base. You have to be health system driven. And then we say, well, but how do you strengthen health system? You don't give them the capacity to tackle diseases, specific diseases. I think this debate now is getting better. But for instance, uh, uh, sometimes it's uh, driven for the poly eradication campaign. Some countries uh, complain because they receive much, much more money for polio than for other diseases which are killing much more people there, you see. It's a problem for every country. I don't think there is a, a unanimous thing. WHO and on a smaller scale TDR, we try to provide information but it's, uh, it's not only a question, a scientific question, it's a political question, it's a budget question, uh, and we heard from the previous, uh, previous uh, uh, presentation how it can be mixed up with uh, 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 suspicion, with all this kind of... Uh, uh, it's, it's, I don't think there is a, an answer how the African countries do, because uh, uh, it's not only Africa. In fact, uh, if you go uh, to the United States, People tell me that 20% of the money of the health budget in the United States is to pay lawyers. 
because uh, you have so much uh, dealing that you have uh, everybody's putting money to get uh, insurance against uh, if you are a doctor. Uh, so a lot of money goes to pay lawyers, not really to, to, to health. And uh, Chris Murray, uh, who heads the cluster in the WHO, show, has his table showing the internal disparities in rich countries, such as the United States. You're not suggesting that as a new priority, uh, lawyers, lawyers. On, on health budgets. So, okay. Um, yes, please. Yeah, I have, I have actually two questions. I was very much impressed by the slides that you showed that Anopheles actually really targets humans and, and not other animals. I was wondering whether people have actually have tried, for example, to humanize the odor of cows. So, um, what are the animals you have? And maybe that's an easy, yeah, and it's probably a big industry there. So, the, the second question is, um, is, is when, when you talked about drugs and that, that um, particular most ne neglected diseases, are just not kind of commercially, um, or drugs are not developed by by um, pharmaceutical companies. For me, the question always comes like how 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 one could get companies to do that. And and in my one part, it might be like an economic incentives that's lacking there, or a regulatory policy that makes it possible to do that. And maybe there are tools around that states already exploit to, to encourage that. In, this, in the United States, for example, they have laws for um, biotech companies to, um, to do research and develop or for drugs, drugs, for often drugs, for yeah. example. Or, I mean, in other sectors, there are laws in California which, for example, force car companies, when they want to sell cars in California, to um, develop electro, like for example, electro cars or something. Yeah. Like that. And I think there are like probably different ways to go about sure. it. But I think there's either a regulatory strategy missing or an economic incentive so for for yeah. the market actually to adopt to that. Yeah. I'm sure this is going to be debated more in, in the meeting. But let me tell you about one mechanism, which is the public-private partnership. Um, for instance, in TDR, we helped create the medicines for malaria venture. We participate in the creation of the Global Alliance for TB Drug Development. We are now interacting with uh, MSF to create the Drugs for Diagnostic Disease Initiative. We also start the Global Forum for Health Research. You can have these kind of incentives, either downstream or upstream. Remember that when uh, I think it was uh, uh, Jeffrey Sachs and all that, that proposed a fund to buy vaccine, they would be ready. This would be the pool mechanism, let's say. If you do research, I, I will pay uh, later on when the product is ready. We also went through the other mechanism, let's say, trying to decrease the cost of research by putting public money in the development or research phase. And this is rationale between, uh, for instance, uh, behind uh, Medicine for Malaria Venture. And Rob Ridley, who is here, who was uh, during some time the uh, scientific officer of MEV, can speak about that. Uh, so there are mechanisms that, uh, and partnership, as I showed in the, in the issue of methylphosine. Uh, but I think you, you, you need much more powerful mechanisms, you see, because uh, <laughs> the perception that we need new tools is not really there. Uh, and there is a big difference between orphan drugs and neglected disease drugs. Orphan drugs, most of them are for genetic disease which are less prevalent, but you can have a rich market for them, you see. While neglected diseases, you don't have such a market. But even so, for in tuberculosis, the Global Alliance published what they call the Pharmacoeconomics Report, showing which were the economic factors in drug development against tuberculosis. Saying that there could be a market, yes. Perhaps not for the big companies, but there could be a market for smaller companies. See? So only now people are really trying to, uh, to get, uh, uh, let's say, to do research on that, how, how, which is the best way. In relation to the other question about how if they have uh, done experiments on the humanization of other Others, I, I think that perhaps Fortis and Janet and others in Tomology or Yeya could uh, uh, answer that later on in the symposium. I'm really not an expert in uh, uh, odorant genes or, or... What I know is that uh, in some cases, for instance, I think uh, they, they detect that some, some insects were attracted by the same smell, the smell of your feet is smell of cheese. I think lamb grubber cheese. Not yeah. surprising. Yeah. <laughs> so some insects are attracted by this kind of smell that sometimes we don't like. But uh, you see, so it's. Uh, I think now with genomics, you are going to really start to understand once you have these genes isolated, how they react, how do that. It's it's a whole new world. It's opening in front of us. One last comment, the gentleman to the left. 
Okay, uh, uh, Yiming Shao from Beijing. Uh, I think uh, uh, the s s all these issues of uh, private uh, making prior uh, priorities for the health agenda and the decision making process. I think there's a lack of uh, um, several point, uh, several elements. One is our scientist community have put a lot of efforts on research, but less on social. Uh, impact uh, about uh, uh, all this decision making process. Uh, this meeting is a good one uh, to to stimulate uh, uh, interest in that aspect. Uh, but I think another thing that we are not united uh, between among ourselves a uh, lack of a consensus. So each group of scientists have their own agenda, and uh, this is also a defect as a whole community. And a third thing I think is uh, we are, for many times, uh, we are shying away from authorities. We are not uh, provocative enough, like uh, many other lobby uh, uh, groups uh, did. Uh, I have two examples. Uh, for example, the, for the AIDS debate, I think we have a profound facts to link HIV with AIDS. But, uh, uh, and also South Africa, in the special case, have enough good scientists, a brilliant scientist, uh, but they are not provocative enough to convince their president for a right decision. And also, another thing at the, uh, at the global level, uh, last year I was uh, visiting uh, with our delegation, uh, Chinese delegation in the Angus meeting uh, for the global uh, uh, global agenda for AIDS, malaria, and TB. Uh, to my surprise, a lot of uh, debate has been spent, more than half of, of the time spent on the dispute between the Western group or on the homosexual be presented in the delegation. Almost no time spent on debate. That is a human right issue. But I think the real big human rights issue is access to drugs to bring treatment to developing countries. We have no time because our focus is on how to put the homosexual group into this meeting. Uh, so I think it's, we are not united, we are not have consensus, we don't have our own agenda, we are not pro provocative enough. That brings the problems. We cannot set in the agenda for the health issues. Uh -huh. uh, Didi wants to... Go ahead. Just on what you, what you said about the South uh, African scientists maybe uh, not being uh, sufficiently uh, provocative, uh, I, I would not uh, quite agree with that. I think uh, 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 the scientists have been not only provocative, but some of them have been very courageous yes, uh, because it, uh, to oppose to the government in uh, in situation, I have some of my friends who have uh, who have been to me very courageous because they have been uh, involved, whether outside of the country or within the country, during the 80s and 90s, early 90s, against the apartheid regime, and so they are to they have a total solidarity, political uh, solidarity. Uh, with this uh, new uh, democratic uh, government. Uh, but at the same time, they had to oppose it. And uh, I think, and they did it. And I think that was uh, uh, very courageous uh, of them. And I would add also that uh, people usually uh, look in a very pessimistic way on what is happening in South Africa uh, today, uh, around the controversy in particular. Uh, I can understand that, and I can understand that it's a tragic situation, but also I think uh, AIDS has opened really a, a, a democratic space, uh, public space in South Africa. Uh, it allowed uh, people to, uh, uh, whether the activists or in some cases scientists and physicians, to open a debate with the government which was almost auto-censured uh, before. So really, uh, 
uh, I, I think we have to take this into account. And I don't know of any other country in Africa, I, I often uh, think about that. I don't know of any uh, country in, in, South, in, uh, in Africa, and I don't know of very many, little, uh, very many uh, in other parts of the world, where you have had such a democratic debate and the possibility that uh, uh, associations could uh, 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 do a trial against the government and win it. So I think this gives us an idea about what is uh, uh, involved now uh, in the democratic space in South Africa. Thank you. Paul, yeah, you just, uh, just a quick run. I oh, mean, there are several yes. elements. It's not a prerogative, it's just one. So as a result, we are not, you know, they need the support from the scientific community of the world to back up the uh, scientists in South yeah. Africa, but we are not giving enough support. So the, you know, as a whole, uh, it's, it's not effective for uh, lobbying. I, I just want to add one thing about, uh, that I think uh, responds in, in part to Professor Schmaus' comment and also DDA's paper and Carlos's, and that is that this rich, <laughs> richly re-socialized account that Didier Fassin gave us, it's not only that the political leadership cannot do it, neither can the scientists nor the activists. They don't know how to refer back to 19th century public health laws. They don't know how to bring in the diamond mining. They don't know how to bring in the, the why the black, predominantly black population would be suspicious of medications and are making the links that they're fa failing to make. That is the links uh, to history, political economy, et cetera. So I, I, would, I would say that, and I, I know you were saying pro provocative is only one small part of the broad panoply of, that we need in order to do a better job. But I think richly resocialized accounts are also in that, that basket of tools. I'm mixing metaphors too much. Uh, and that uh, just as uh, a, gu a president of a state can't do it, neither, neither could the uh, scientists nor the activists in that country. Thank you very much. I think the session is drawing to a close.